I'd like to uh, thank the Lennox Gasto Syndrome Foundation for asking me to speak today and I'll be uh, presenting on results of our uh, Estelle study of deep brain stimulation for treatment of Lennox Gasto Syndrome, uh, uh, particularly given that this has uh, recently been accepted for publication in the Annals of Neurology. Now epilepsy uh, can be uh, considered as a network disorder and by that I mean that a range of specific underlying causes can present with the same electroclinical phenotype. A useful analogy is a traffic jam, a network problem we're all very familiar with. And in this uh, situation, uh, iron, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, an iron channel disorder, uh, for example, a nail in a tire, could cause a sequence of events ultimately leading to uh, a failure in the transport mechanism, a uh, traffic jam, a situation we're all very familiar with. But of course, a, a range of different causes can cause exactly the same mode of network failure. It may be that the uh, bus has broken down or that uh, a car has got a flat battery, but the same pattern of uh, traffic jam will occur. And of course, uh, at, at, depending on the time of the day, the same consequence may in fact not cause a traffic jam. So if it's in the middle of the night, it doesn't matter if someone gets a flat tire. A corollary of this, uh, of course, is that the uh, solution to traffic jams is not to replace the tyre on every car every day, but is in fact to put a new lane on the freeway. So uh, network problems require network solutions. Now, for a while, uh, we've been uh, trying to understand the uh, several net cerebral networks underpinning the epileptic process of Lennox Gasto syndrome. In a series of papers, including this one in 2019, we showed that during a burst of generalized epileptiform activity, uh, including generalized paroxysmal fast activity, you see widespread cortical activation accounting for the, the, the apparently generalized appearance on scalp EEG. But interestingly, not the whole, it's not the whole brain that's involved. If you look carefully, you can appreciate that primary sensory motor cortex, primary visual cortex, and indeed primary auditory cortex are spared. Uh, and the, but the areas that are maximally involved are widespread areas of association cortex, the so-called thinking cortex. We've shown in other publications, in this and other publications, that the same pattern of diffuse involvement of association cortex is seen in young children with early onset uh, Lennox Gasto, as well as in adults with the established LGS phenotype. And we've also shown that there uh, is overlap between the areas of uh, cortex involved and a well-recognized major cognitive develop, uh, cognitive networks, including those responsible for attention, such as the dorsal attention network and executive control network, uh, uh, simultaneously with areas that are normally responsible for quiet internal reflective thinking, such as the default mode network. And this is quite an abnormal pattern of beh network behavior, this sort of synchronous involvement of these uh, sets of networks. And uh, suggests a fundamental breakdown in cognitive network behavior, uh, perhaps accounting for some uh, elements of the process of epileptic encephalopathy that is a key, that is a key feature of LGS. Well, um, now that I've hopefully convinced you that Lennox Gasto syndrome is a, a network uh, epilepsy, indeed a so-called secondary network epilepsy, where the epileptic activity enters into and is amplified through these intrinsic cognitive networks. Now that I've shown you that, the next question is, well, how can we tackle this problem? How do you tackle a network epilepsy when you clearly can't operate to remove those, all of those networks? And one approach, of course, is neuromodulation, for example, with deep brain stimulation. Now, robust evidence of the effectiveness of uh, deep brain stimulation uh, came in the Sante study released in 2010 in about 100 patients who received um, duty cycle stimulation to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. And that, that 
a new thalamic nucleus was chosen because it projects heavily to the limbic circuits and about 90% of the patients in the Sante study had either temporal or frontal lobe epilepsy. This, sorry, this provided convincing evidence of seizure reductions of around 30 to 50% after three months of stimulation. And by two years of stimulation, around 50% of patients had on average a 50% seizure reduction. But what about for Lennox Gasto syndrome? Well, there's been no, until Estelle, there's been no controlled studies, but there had been some very interesting results from the Velasco group with a series of 13 patients accumulated over several years with stimulation into the centromedian nucleus, showing uh, after eight, 18 months of stimulation, about 80% seizure reduction. The centromedian nucleus was chosen because this, this is known to have influence on widespread cortical regions. And given that the uh, underlying circuitry of LGS was not clear, it was, felt to be sen it was felt sensible to choose a target that had a diffuse influence. So we uh, thought it was timely to uh, perform a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomised clinical trial of uh, duty cycle deep brain stimulation to the centromedian nucleus in a cohort of patients with Lennox Gasto syndrome to try and prove definitively whether it does or is it does or does not work. And you can see in the image here, this is after we've implanted our 20th patient and our uh, surgeons giving the thumbs up uh, that uh, we've achieved that milestone. You can see that we use the Medtronic device with duty cycle stimulation on for a minute, off for five, for five minutes. And we had quite strict entry criteria. All patients had to have tonic seizures and EEG evidence of both generalized paroxysmal fast activity, typically during sleep and slow spike and wave. We had uh, a priori defined primary and secondary outcomes. The primary outcome was the proportion of patients with a greater than 50% reduction in diary recorded seizures comparing the treatment and control arms. And a series of secondary outcome measures including EEG markers uh, um, of uh, seizure suppression uh, from 24-hour uh, ambulatory EEGs acquired at key time points, as well as some safety measures looking at cognitive and behavioural um, uh, uh, markers. This uh, shows the overall study design in the pink box. You can see a three month baseline period during which seizure diaries uh, documented a seizure frequency averaged uh, over the uh, month. An average over each month. And then there's implantation at time zero, and then quite a prolonged second baseline period of three months, uh, where again we simply documented without having any devices turned on. And then the key, uh, the primary endpoint is in the pale blue box, comparing seizure outcomes over three months when half are switched on and half are not yet turned on before the uh, uh, that second half are also switched on such that all of the patients uh, receive stimulation for the last three months of the study. When we commenced this study, it was felt that it was not possible to reliably identify the location of the centromedian nucleus in individual patients. Uh, and, but because many patients with Lennox Gasto syndrome have uh, um, distorted anatomy uh, due to structural brain anomalies, we uh, had to come up with a way of doing this. And this been, uh, we've published this recently uh, uh, just last year. And we're quite encouraged by the, uh, mid, the, uh, the middle panel there showing the location of the contact electrodes in relation to the centromedian nucleus in yellow that really we, we feel we've did a pretty good job um, uh, achieving the target location. Uh, this slide shows the, uh, the clinical characteristics of the cohort with a mean age of 25, uh, a, a somewhat of a female predominance as is often seen in uh, uh, trials, and a range of etiologies including genetic, uh, lesional and unknown causes, and of course a number of the patients that had prior procedures including uh, vagal nerve stimulation and corpus callosotomy. One interesting uh, observation coming from the baseline data was the marked discrepancy between uh, seizure diaries 
uh, uh, seizure diary measures of uh, frequency, which were uh, three per day. And we're just talking countable seizures here, tonic seizures and convulsions. We're not talking atypical absence, which we felt were too hard to reliably document. But if you compare that to uh, EEG measures of seizures, which we defined as sustained bursts of generalised paroxysmal fast activity lasting more than five seconds, you can see there's a marked discrepancy with over 300 electrographic seizures per day, suggesting that seizure diaries really are only capturing the tip of the iceberg. So here's our primary outcome and it shows that 50% of patients in the treatment arm did have a 50% or greater um, uh, reduction in seizures. Uh, but uh, also uh, to uh, about 20% of patients in the control arm uh, achieved that. And so this was actually not a statistically significant difference. Uh, interestingly, however, the uh, results from the EEG, as I said, uh, obtained at those key time points showed a marked difference, a significant difference, where 90% of patients had a greater than 50% reduction in EEG seizures during stimulation, whereas none of the patients in the control arm did. You can also look at this by following uh, seizure frequency or the, the mean reduction in seizures from the baseline period over the course of the study. And you can see that the patients in blue receiving early stimulation during the blinded uh, phase in the, in the pink box had lower, uh, on average, had lower seizures than those uh, not receiving stimulation indicated in the grey line. But once those patients are turned on, the two lines converge uh, I think providing supporting evidence of a treatment effect. This is even more uh, dramatically seen from the, uh, the uh, more objective measures of seizure frequency recorded from uh, ambulatory EEG. If we compare the uh, results at the, the key point at the end of the three months of the blinded phase, you can see that there is a suggestion of a, a there is a, a, a lower mean seizure frequency in the treatment arm, but this is not significantly different from the control arm due to a fairly wide spread of uh, data. Whereas in the EEG data, we see a similar magnitude of seizure reduction, but due to a lower spread in the data, this is a significant difference. We also compared uh, seizure frequency at study exit in relation to study entry. And you can see that uh, almost all the patients had a reduction in seizures, some quite an impressive reduction with the mean uh, reduction in seizures about 50% uh, in both uh, EEG and uh, clinical seizure measures. Well, what about uh, perioperative uh, issues? The median length of stay was about three days, but there was a couple of patients who ended up staying for a little over two weeks, predominantly due to uh, post-operative drowsiness. Now this was mild in most people, but there were three patients who had quite marked post-operative drowsiness, such that they actually were not uh, eating and required nasogastric feeding for about a week until the drowsiness settled. Imaging in these patients showed uh, edema along the electrode tract, and this is a recognised phenomenon of so-called mega edema um, that is reported in the Parkinson's literature, but we felt it seemed to be a little more frequent in our patient cohort. But we're not entirely sure whether this is due to the youth of uh, relative youth of our cohort and perhaps greater vasoreactivity, uh, perhaps due to recurrent uh, seizure activity or some other um, phenomenon. A lot of patients, the majority had seizures in the perioperative period, but perhaps this isn't surprising given their pre-implantation seizure frequency. And unfortunately, one of our 20 patients uh, developed infection in the uh, extension leads, uh, which unfortunately required the whole uh, leads box and the whole uh, system to be explanted two months after implantation prior to randomization and prior to stimulation. Uh, this slide lists the various uh, uh, side effects, uh, the more minor side effects, and you can see, perhaps not surprisingly, in the pre-stimulation column in the early post-operative period, patients were describing headache and pain over the implantation site, which is not surprising. These issues also, uh, these issues resolved. 
In the blue boxes, you can see uh, uh, some uh, side effects that are probably related to the actual stimulation, and they included some tingling uh, in the uh, arm and the face. Uh, we, I should just point out that our blinded uh, trial coordinator, uh, our, our trial coordinator, who was the one who was not blinded to stimulation status, uh, adjusted the uh, stimulator settings to reduce these uh, side effects. Uh, and typically these were only reported uh, for an hour or two uh, when the device was first turned on and would then settle. So these are transient side effects. Uh, and would not really uh, did not really uh, impact the um, the uh, blinding in uh, in the subsequent assessments. Um, I'd like to now just talk about some of the uh, cognitive and uh, uh, other measures taken. You can see here that we took these at, again at key time points along the course of the study. Uh, we uh, assessments included a, a, a global assessment of the severity of epilepsy, a seven point scale completed by carers uh, or parents. And this did show a significant reduction in the proportion of patients uh, reported to be uh, to have severe or very severe epilepsy over the course uh, of the study. Uh, and similarly, the uh, global assessment of a disability scale also showed a significant reduction over the course of the study. So this is encouraging to show that we're not certainly not making things worse, we probably are, are helping. Some more formal measures of cognition came from uh, the NIH toolbox. Uh, this is an iPad based test here and you can see uh, Linda Dalek uh, uh, taking one of our patients through this assessment. Of course, not all patients were able to do this. 13 or had the, uh, were able to complete uh, this assessment. And I think what you can see is that there's no deterioration in cogn cognition over the course of the study. And in fact, there's a non-significant trend towards improvement. Similarly, the uh, ABAS, which is an uh, assessment of uh, living skills, uh, did not show any deterioration over the course of the study. And that, of course, stands in contrast to uh, many of the medications which we prescribe, which tend to have sedating effects. We also asked carers for a sort of global uh, perspective as to whether they thought things were better, worse or the same at the end of the study. And over th about three quarters of the carers felt patients were better off at the end of the study compared to the start. And things commonly reported was that patients were more awake, more alert, more interactive, as sort of looking out at the world, learning a bit more from the world. And this, is, I think, is extremely encouraging. There was a proportion of patients uh, who carers felt were worse. And interestingly, some of these were patients in whom seizure uh, diaries showed quite a significant reduction in seizure frequency. But uh, the, the, the family said, well, look, they've been through this whole procedure. They're still having seizures. We've still got to watch them 24 hours a day. So in their minds, that made things worse because they'd undertaken a procedure and they still needed to be closely supervised. So I think speaking to the importance of having really setting realistic expectations when discussing uh, DBS as a treatment modality. Well, um, I wanted to just speak a little bit more now about some other interesting work we uh, are continuing on from the Estill study. And this is work by uh, Aaron Warren in our group. Uh, and what, he's do what we're doing here is trying to see if we can understand whether the location of stimulation predicts treatment response. Uh, and so what, what Aaron's done here is he's taken uh, the percentage reduction in seizures, whether scored from diaries or from the EEG, and compared that to where we were stimulating. This can be calculated because we, we have the post-operative CT, which we can co-register the MRI. We know what contact we were stimulating from and the voltage uh, being delivered. And so we can then calculate a volume of tissue that's being activated. And when you compare the volume of tissue activated to the percentage seizure reduction, you can then uh, generate a, a graphic where the colors in red represent areas with greater seizure reduction compared to the areas in blue where stimulation was not 
uh, was associated with a less uh, a, a smaller degree of seizure reduction. And what we found is that the, the sweet spot, if you like, for uh, stimulation it was interestingly on the very lateral and uh, inferior margin of the central median nucleus, not perhaps right in the central median nucleus as you might expect. Well, the other thing we can do with this data is to then ask the question, well, hang on, where are these thalamic uh, stimulation, where is this thalamic stimulation projecting to? So ultimately the goal of stimulation, thalamic stimulation, is to modulate cortical excitability. We're not trying to block seizures, we're trying to modulate the excitability of connected cortical regions. So we can then, uh, we can then look and say, well, where on average is uh, this uh, central median target projecting to? And not surprisingly, we see maximal connectivity to pericentral cortex, which is a known which is the known major direct cortical connection in, uh, in, uh, of the central median nucleus. The other diffuse uh, uh, cortical uh, influences of the central median nucleus actually are dependent on um, secondary uh, projections through pathways through the basal ganglia. But we can also uh, then ask, well, hang on, which uh, cortical projections most likely predict reductions in seizure frequency and that's the middle panel here and interestingly that shows a slightly different pattern uh, in other words when the uh, thalamic target projects to posterior frontal regions that's when you get the most significant reduction in seizure and of course this then shows quite nice symmetry with our earlier studies of the um, lgs network which also recruits this same region Coming back to the point I made at the start, which is if you want to modulate uh, uh, excitability, you need to be targeting uh, a, a key node, a node that projects to the key epileptic network. So in conclusion, I think uh, we have, uh, still has shown there is evidence of therapeutic benefit of stimulation of the central median nucleus. Although our primary outcome was not achieved, there were a number of secondary outcomes that were positive. In particular, there was a significant reduction in, in e objective EEG measures of seizures. And overall, between study entry and study exit, we did find an, a seizure reduction of around 50%. We've also shown that Estelle is over, uh, is that shown that uh, DBS is essentially safe. There is some initial post-operative drowsiness that you need to be aware of. Uh, and there are some initial stimulation uh, um, side effects, including paresthesia, but these are mild and short-lived. But we did not see any deterioration in cognitive uh, or functional ability and perhaps even a slight trend towards an improvement. We've identified a sweet spot in the central median nucleus that seems to predict that seems to be uh, offer superior seizure suppression, and it may be that this relates to its projection to uh, the uh, LGS network. I'd like to thank the various uh, organisations, institutions, and funding bodies, including the Lennox Gastro Foundation, for their support of this work. And finally, and very importantly, we uh, would like to thank the families and the participants. Uh, this is, you know, a significant commitment for people. Uh, and uh, we like to think we've made uh, a difference. Uh, I should point out that all of these uh, patients and their families were happy to have their photos included in this presentation, which I think speaks to their uh, willingness to participate in the study. Special thanks to the Estelle team, including Linda Dalek, who uh, is uh, completing her PhD on this work and really did most of the clinical work and EEG markup. Aaron, who continues to do marvellous imaging analysis. Annie Roten, who uh, was our trial coordinator, adjusting the stimulation devices as per protocol. Christian Bullis, our neurosurgeon. Wesley Thesevert and uh, Parkinson's DBS expert who shared his skills with us. And Leonard Sherilov, who is a biostatistician. Thank you very much.